Hi, welcome to today's training, AAC or Augmentative and Alternative Communication for OTs. My name is Marlena Lanini. I'm an occupational therapist working with Montech, Montana State Assistive Technology Program. And this training was recorded as part of the Mountain West OT Conference. This training will be ideal for occupational therapists that are new to AAC. So if you have a clients that use communication devices or nonverbal clients, and you're really not sure how you can set them up for success as an occupational therapist, this entry level course will give you the basic skills that you need to get started working with your clients that use communication devices. All right, AAC for OTs, let's get started. There are really three reasons why I think it's really important as occupational therapists to know about AAC or communication devices. The first is that if we do nothing else with our clients with the communication device, we are a communication partner with all of our clients. So as a good occupational therapist, I want to provide choices during my therapy session. I need to have some back and forth communication to identify valued occupations and what my client's goals might be and how we're progressing towards those goals. So I owe it to all of my clients, including my nonverbal clients, to have those same expectations and provide those same opportunities for communication during therapy. Um, but in order for us to be able to do that as occupational therapists, it's really helpful to know some basics about how the communication devices work and how we can best support our clients. So that will be the first part of what we're learning about today. The second reason it's important for us as occupational therapists to know a little bit about communication devices is that our skill set as occupational therapists are really critical to being able to help improve our client's physical access to the device. So if we have clients that are both nonverbal as, and also have motor impairments, we as occupational therapists have a skill set that can help improve access to that communication device, meaning we can help make the communication faster or provide a more robust communication options by improving physical access to the device. Um, and so our skill set as occupational therapists is a really important part of the therapy team working with communication devices. And then the third reason that I think it's important for us as occupational therapists is that communication device does so much more than communication. So yes, it, it will communicate and speak words out loud, but I can also use that same device for so many other occupations and goals that I might have with my client. So I could use it for things for work, for school, for leisure, for controlling the environment around the house. There's so many other things that I can do. So we're going to spend um, today looking at these three things and what we can do as occupational therapists. So let's get started. First, we are going to define a few terms before um, we get into the three sections of today's training. Um, I'm going to use a lot of these terms interchangeably. And when I use all of these terms, what I mean really is any kind of communication. Okay, so I might use the ter generic term communication device. I might use AAC, which stands for augmentative and alternative communication. And that's just kind of how it sounds. Augmentative means it can augment verbal communication, or it can be a complete alternative communication device. And SGD, you'll hear that a lot, um, especially when you're looking at insurance funding, they'll fund something called a speech generating device. So I'm going to use all of those terms interchangeably today. Um, and like any assistive technology, communication devices can range from very low tech. Like you see, I have a, um, a pod book in the upper left-hand corner there. So it has kind of a spiral bound across the top. So that's a big binder full of different communication options. There's nothing electronic about it. It doesn't say anything out loud. Um, below that, I have an example of a really simple um, communication device, a Big Mac. It only records one message when you hit that button. And then off to the right, I have some really... Um, more complex or higher tech 
communication devices. They have interlinking dynamic displays. And what that means is if I push a button, I can open up a whole nother menu of communication options. So like if I push the button food, I can up, open up a whole page full of different food options that I might wanna say out loud. Um, so there's a lot of variety in communication devices. So let's get started talking about some of the basics of AAC and how we can support our client's success. So these are the five principles that I'm gonna go over um, today. There's a lot of um, research behind communication devices and best practices, and there are many more um, best practices than just these five. But I think if you have just these five to get started with, it will really give you a lot of confidence and know how to best support your clients that are using communication devices. So the first principle that I want to talk about is presuming confidence. Um, and you might also hear this referred to as the least dangerous assumption. And what the least dangerous assumption means is that if my assumptions about my client are incorrect, I want to make sure that I am choosing the path that has the least dangerous effect on my client's likelihood of developing the skills needed to be an independent adult with a rich, full life. So the least dangerous assumption for me is to presume competence, set high expectations, and then provide a lot of teaching and support to reach those goals. So with respect to communication devices, I want to make sure that I am presuming competence and I am not limiting, limiting someone's ability to learn communication and learn words by limiting the words that I provide that are available. So I don't wanna provide a device that has very limited communication options because then those are the only words I have available to say. Um, I also don't wanna limit somebody's ability to use a communication device because they have difficulty accessing it, meaning they have difficulty reaching out and pointing at the option that they want. So I need to presume competence set high expectations, and then provide that support needed to meet those goals. So when we talk about speaking style, there's a couple of things um, that will help us have that back and forth communication with our clients that use communication devices. And this might be a little bit different if you're working with emergent communicators like young children who are learning to communicate and learning how to use their device all at the same time or if you're working with an adult or a teenager who's you know, a proficient communicator and they know how to use their device already, this might look a little bit different depending on who you're um, working with and you can always adjust. Um, but a couple of key things that I think will help you have that back and forth communication. The first, especially for emergent communicators, is that we wanna emphasize core vocabulary. And core vocabulary um, is really a small set of words that make up the majority of words we use in a daily conversation. So um, if you have access to a robust core vocabulary, that probably would make up about you know, 80% or so of what you want to say during the day. So examples of core vocabulary are words like do, stop, it's, different, more, um, go, all kinds of words like that. And so you notice all of those words that I just said, None of them were nouns. So core vocabulary typically does not include nouns. And the words are also a little bit abstract. So they're somewhat harder to teach than it is with something that's very concrete, like a noun. Um, but if we can emphasize core vocabulary, we're really providing um, our clients with much more flexible um, communication options so they can have a much more robust conversation. Um, so you're going to hear emphasis on core quite a bit, and you'll find that I think a lot of them are very easy to, to incorporate into your therapy sessions. The next thing I want you to be aware of is that communicating with a device takes much more time than verbally communicating. So we need to make sure we provide enough wait time for our clients to make sure that it can be a back and forth communication. Um, you know, initially, this may feel like it's even an uncomfortable amount of time for you to be quiet and just wait and do whatever you need to do to make sure you kind of get in that habit, whether you need to count in your head 
to make sure that um, you're just silent for a little bit to make sure you provide that wait time so that clients have the opportunity to communicate back with us. Um, the other type of, um, the other speaking style pointer would be to ask open-ended questions. Um, now, obviously it's important sometimes to ask closed-ended questions. Um, are you done with that? Uh, did you want more pizza? Um, you know, so those are simple yes, no type questions where they're very close-ended, but you wanna also ask open-ended questions. So not only does that allow for much more robust communication back and forth, um, but it also is really helpful if um, you're asking a closed-ended question and the answer is some word that's not programmed into the device yet. So if I ask an open-ended question, that would allow my client to use core vocabulary to describe something in a variety of different ways um, to, to be able to answer the question. Whereas if I ask a closed-ended question and they don't have that one specific word, they can't really answer my question. So make sure you get in the habit of trying to pepper in some open-ended questions and you'll learn a lot more about your clients. Um, and the last thing that I want you to be aware of is, is just accepting multiple modes of communication. And what I mean by that is we all communicate in other ways rather than just verbally. We communicate non-verbally. So I might point at something. I might, you know, nod my head, shake my head, or make a facial expression. And it's going to be pretty clear to you what I mean, right? And you're not going to tell me, okay, now say that out loud, Marlena. So we want to do the same thing with our clients that use communication devices. If they are communicating with us, not using the device, and it's pretty clear what that communication is, accept that and move on to the next item. We don't need to make somebody repeat something on their device that they just clearly communicated to us. So the third basic for working with AAC is to plan for motor memory. And the, um, the good news is, is that many of the communication apps and software um, have started to recognize this principle. There's a lot of research behind it and have started to plan the layout of the words on the device with motor memory in mind. And so what that means when I talk about planning for motor memory is that a proficient user is going to not be scanning looking for a particular symbol. They're not going to be scanning this page looking for a word. In fact, they might not even be readers yet. Um, they're going to remember where that word is based on a motor pattern from having used that word over and over again. So the symbols and the words are there just to support literacy, okay? So remember that they are to support literacy. That's not what a user is using to be able to say that word out loud to you. So what that means to us is that we don't wanna move things around on the device unless absolutely necessary. Try to have keywords in just one location if possible. So I think we've all seen devices that have um, been programmed where well-intentioned uh, support people are adding in the same word, but putting it in different places all over the device. So, you know, you might have the word goldfish programmed into the device and in five or six different locations and that don't make any sense to the user, but might make a sense to the adults that are working with them. Um, and you want to plan the layout also to reduce the number of pages that you have to scroll through to find words because that takes time. So the more navigation you have to do on the device, the more time it takes. And so if we can plan that layout to reduce the navigation, that's really helpful for robust communication. So, um, you know, from the outset, we want to work with speech language pathologists to make sure that we are, um, as a team, selecting a communication um, platform that has motor memory already baked into the format of it. But then once we have that, we want to make sure that when we're customizing things, we uh, don't mess up the motor, the motor memory piece. So I'm going to give an example that might be really um, useful to relate to as an occupational therapist. So um, 
Many of you might be touch typists on a QWERTY keyboard, which is the standard keyboard. You may also be aware of an alternative keyboard called the Dvorak keyboard, which is billed as an ergonomic keyboard um, that supposedly would reduce my um, repetitive strain injury risk by making sure that the keys that I hit most frequently are used by some of the um, bigger muscles in my hand. So it's you know a more efficient layout. So um, if I were to just move a bunch of stuff around without a lot of thought or training or care on somebody's communication device, it would be very similar if I came into your clinic and I said, you know what? I am going to do you a favor. I'm gonna take your QWERTY keyboard, throw it in the trash. I am gonna give you a much better keyboard. I gave you this Dvorak keyboard and you are gonna thank me tonight when you write your soap notes because your fingers are gonna be feeling good. Um, like think about if you had to use this keyboard to write your soap notes tonight, you'd, you'd be mad at me, I would guess. Um, I wouldn't wanna be around to see your reaction if I did that. Um, you know, you have all the letters and the punctuation and the numbers that you need. You certainly can write your soap notes. I gave you everything that you need, but they all are in a different location for, you know, something that used to be automatic. When you write your soap notes, you probably don't think about where to place each finger on the keyboard. That part is automatic because you have that motor memory. So you don't have to think about it and you can write your soap notes really quickly and efficiently. If I gave you this keyboard and I moved things around, I would make that much, much more difficult for you. It would be more time consuming. It would be frustrating. You might eventually be able to relearn this new format, but it's not going to be easy for you. Okay, so hopefully that illustrates why we don't just move things around. So I don't mean to say that when we're planning for motor memory, that means we can't customize um, the communication app. We absolutely want to customize that to add meaningful content for our clients. However, when we do that, we just need to do it in a thoughtful manner. So collaborate with your speech language pathologist to make sure that the organization of the language makes sense and that it's in line with the motor plan that's already kind of baked into that communication device. Um, so one thing that we want to avoid is creating custom pages for very specific activities. So um, as an occupational therapist, you might be tempted to create a folder called OT and then put all the vocab that you want in there for OT, you know, swings, coloring, painting, whatever options that you think you might want during occupational therapy sessions. Um, but that's not going to be helpful for your client. It might be helpful for you to find those words, but not for your client. So avoid doing that. And then we'll look at a little bit later a way that you can easily find the words that you wanna make sure um, you're incorporating into your therapy sessions. So the um, next concept that I wanna talk about is modeling. So this is something that we wanna do in every single therapy session um, with all of our clients. And you might hear um, people refer to this as aided language stimulation. It's the same thing. I'm gonna show you a quick video on this and modeling is really, really critical, especially when we're working with emerging communicators. Um, so just a quick word here, I know some of us work with adults with kids, if you're working with somebody who's a proficient communicator and they're proficient with their device and they don't need any more education on communicating and how to use their device, this is probably one that you would skip. You wouldn't reach in and touch somebody's device if they know how to use it already and they're already proficient communicators. But this um, is really very key for emerging communicators. So I'm gonna show you a video by Assistiveware because they do a really nice job of explaining this. Modeling, use AAC to teach AAC. No matter where you are in your adventure to build communication with AAC, modeling is a valuable strategy. Modeling means you point to words on the AAC tool as you speak. Ready, set, go. Go! Look, I like this book. Ah, oh, look, we, we go, go to, to places, more outdoor places, beach. beach. We go to beach. We went to the beach. 
You cannot simply place an AAC tool in front of someone and expect that they will know how to use it to communicate. We need to model. AAC learners need to see AAC in use to communicate real messages in real situations. So, point to words on the AAC. When you first start, it can be difficult and feel clumsy. Everyone feels that way at first. Start small and build up your modelling. Focus on a few words to model at first. Every time you model, it will get easier. The most important thing is to start, give it a go. Get others involved. Who else in the team can model? Get friends, family members, classmates and siblings modelling. The more the merrier. Now, you can model on your iPad or device or even on a paper-based version. Model throughout the day, especially during real, meaningful and motivating activities. Model in conversations. Show how you can use different words to communicate different messages. You do not have to model every word that you say. And sometimes the grammar might be wrong. All these things are okay. Modeling does not need to be perfect. You will make mistakes. Every time the learner sees you model, it builds their knowledge. Your modeling will help them to learn how they can use words to communicate. Make it fun and enjoy the adventure. adventure. For more information, read our full article in Learn AAC. If you're having difficulty modeling because you're not familiar where some of the vocabulary is located, I'm going to show you a handy feature that you can use to become more familiar with the communication app. So the app that I happen to have here with me today is Lamp Words for Life. And if I go into menu, there's an option for me called Word Finder. Now it won't be called Word Finder in every communication app. Some of them it will be called Search or have a big magnifying glass, but there's typically a way for me to look up where a word is located. So I'm going to use Candy for a demonstration today because I'm going to be talking about an upcoming hol holiday of Halloween. So it found Candy in my vocab. I'm going to select it and what it's going to do is it's going to gray out all the other word options and show me exactly where I need to touch to navigate Candy. to the word that I wanted to model. So not only did I just become more familiar with how to navigate through the communication app and find words that I wanted, but I also just modeled where Candy was for the user of the device as well. The fifth and final principle we'll talk about today is keeping the AAC device near your client at all times. So a little catchy phrase that can help you remember this is if you see me, you can see my AAC. So we wanna make sure that our clients have the accessories with the device that make sure it's easily portable so that it's with them in every day, all day, every environment that they go into. And insurance will actually fund these accessories. So when you get a device through insurance, it will come with the accessories that you see on the device on the left hand side. It usually has a handle at the top, a shoulder strap that makes it easy to carry around and a little kickstand that comes out back to make it easy to use when you're sitting at a table. If a client uses a wheelchair, it also includes the mounting hardware to connect the communication device to the wheelchair so that it's available at all times. So let's move into the second part of today's training, um, AAC access. So this part is really exciting as an occupational therapist because this is where our unique skills and training as OTs um, can help our clients succeed by helping them find the easiest access method available to the communication device. Sorry about that. Um, so first we want to make sure that a client's physical access is not limiting their communication opportunities. And what I mean by that is if we have a client who's both nonverbal and also has motor challenges, we wanna make sure that we don't give them a device that fits maybe something that they can easily interact with physically, but doesn't give them the communication options that they need. So this is a picture of a um, kind of a low-tech communication device called a GoTalk. And this particular one only has 
four options. And the buttons on it are great. They're nice big buttons, so they're really easy to hit. And it's a nice big target. But you can see that I only have four options plus two more at the top. So I have six options. Um, and now I can even, if you've used one of these before, you know I can change levels. So I really have five levels with four options I can change out. So I really have 20 words that I can change out. But if I have motor challenges, I probably would have also a difficult time changing out the levels myself. I'd probably need somebody to do that for me. So that means I really have four words available at any one time. So if you had only four words available to you, which would you choose? Would you be happy with the ones that someone picked here on this particular device? I know I immediately look at it and, and think, well, how do I say I don't like something I, or I don't want something or stop? You know, I don't even have the opposite of these words to say. So we wanna make sure that we do is that we don't provide a device that fits somebody's physical abilities, but doesn't give them the communication options that they need. So remember, again, we wanna presume competence and we wanna make sure that we provide an access method that gives somebody access to the communication options um, that they may need. So before we get started looking into a bunch of different communication options, I'm gonna show you a quick video. This young man's name is Ryan Carter and he has this YouTube video available. And he is going to show you um, or talk you through rather all the different alternative access methods that he's used in the past and what he's using today. So his story is great because he talks about why things did or didn't work for him and how many different things he's tried. Um, he also talks a lot about what kind of things he uses his device for. So I want you to be thinking about that too for when we get to the third part of the training today. I'm Ryan Carter and I'm 20 years old. I live in Sonoya, Georgia, which is 45 minutes south of Atlanta. I enjoy going deer hunting and going to NASCAR races. I also water and snow ski. I am a very outgoing person. I have mixed CP. I have tried several devices in my past. The Dynavox, Vangry, and the Eco. My aunt got them for me when I was in school. Those did not work out for me back then because of the access capabilities. They slowed me down. I tried many different types of access methods. One was a switch button that we attached with Velcro to my headrest on my wheelchair. I would click it when it came to the letters I wanted. This was called scanning. I know for some people, it is their only way of accessing. For me, it was so time consuming and I would become very frustrated. I also tried using my hand to access the device with the K guard. That wasn't effective for me because I could not efficiently get to the keys I also tried using an infrared dot that went between my eyes. That did not work out for me because I always had to recalibrate due to the fact that I move a lot. My frustration with the accessibility of all these devices finally got the best of me and I began using a rubber alphabet board that had from a Tiziana. I would begin spelling a word and whoever was with me would word predict what I was wanting to say. I used the board as my primary way to communicate throughout high school because it was the fastest way for me. I had to write my junior paper with my spell board. Talk about time consuming. I have a Toby with the eye gaze, and I have had it for two years now. It is easy to use. I pick right up on it. Once you take the time to practice and learn it, the Toby with the eye gaze is the right tool that I needed in my life. It is definitely a blessing from God. 
It has everything that I need on it. I can communicate with it. It is cool, because now I can have a conversation with any person. That is really cool that I can do that. The Turby also has phone and texting capability. That gives me the ability to stay home by myself, and my mom doesn't have to worry about going to the store and worrying if I'm all right at home. She can just text me, hey buddy, are you all right? I can text back, yes I am fine. The Turby also allows me to get on the internet, where I spend a lot of time on Facebook. Ha ha. I can also control my TV with my Toby. Sometimes my friend and I fight over what we are going to watch. Ha ha. It also has the capability to control lights, DVD player, doors, and a power bed if you have one. You can basically say it has environmental controls. I'm really glad that I have my Toby. I use it from the time I get up in the morning until the time I go to bed. I would say that this Toby device will benefit children and older adults. It would give them the freedom to say what they want to, when they want to. That was a huge deal for me right there. To be able to say things when I want to and not having people try to guess what I'm saying. My Toby has opened my communication up a huge way. I was diagnosed with CP when I was two years old. I had no surgeries. When I was a child, I didn't really think of myself having a disability. I just thought life was normal. As for me right now, I'm studying business online. For the future, I'm going to have a business with one of my best friends. We are going to have a business that helps people with physical challenges. I plan on having a wife and a family one day. I put that in God's hands. My advice is, go for your goals. Do not let someone tell you can't do something, because you can do anything that you want to. You live your life how you want to and have faith. So listening to Ryan's story, he was talking about how cumbersome some of the access methods were for him and how much they slowed him down, especially like when he had to wait for somebody else to guess what he was trying to spell. So when we're thinking about access method, we really wanna think about the speed of using that communication device. So a spontaneous speech, just me talking is usually about 135 words a minute. And the proficient communication device user is gonna be at about 10 words per minute. So that's much, much slower to use a communication device. And that's for a proficient user. So that's somebody who can likely isolate their finger and reach out and touch a target on a screen accurately and quickly. So for our clients that also have motor challenges, that might be even slower. So our goal for alternative access is to make it as fast and as easy as possible. We wanna pick the least restrictive option so that it the access method does not get in the way of communication. Okay, before we look at the alternative access methods, I wanna take a moment to talk about positioning because that positioning is going to be crucial um, to making sure that our clients can easily use the communication device. So when we're doing evaluations, we wanna think about where is our client um, throughout the day and evening, what kind of positions are they in? Um, what kind of adjustments can we make to their positioning that's going to promote accurate movement? And remember to control that device. It's not just accurate movement, but it's going to be something they have to repeat over and over and over again through the day. So we want to make sure it's something they can do fairly quickly. And also something that doesn't cause any pain. We want this to be pain-free. We don't want it to be too fatiguing because again, the goal is we want to make sure somebody can communicate all day, every day when they need to. So there are a lot of different mounting options and we talked earlier that insurance will fund the mounting options that go with the communication device. So it's really important that we evaluate this um, from the beginning and make sure that we get really great mounting options for our clients. Um, because really that mount is key to ensuring that the communication device is portable and then it goes everywhere our client goes. Um, there's also different types of mounts, different brands of mounts. All of them are adjustable so that we can adjust where that device is located relative to our client and make sure that they're easy to use. Um, but you also wanna think about who does the adjustment on the device. Is it going to be a caregiver or is it going to be the person who uses the communication device? Um, most mounts are only adjustable by a second person, but there are some mounts like the mountain mover mount that can be adjusted by the user. 
So if you remember back to Ryan Carter's video, do you remember when he was getting out of bed and he moved his communication device himself that was on a mount? That was a mountain mover mount. And the mount here um, that this young woman is using at the bar, that one is a mount that somebody else would have to move and adjust for her. But again, we can adjust those mounts to make sure that the communication device is in a good position for our client. So how do we control communication devices? Most of them out of the box, they're going to be designed to be direct access, meaning we reach out and we touch the button that we want. Okay, but no worries. This device is usually either an iPad or a computer. So all of those alternative access methods that we know of as OTs where we help people use a computer or, or a tablet, um, you can pretty much use those exact same methods on their communication device. All right, so let's look at some of the options. These are all the different options that we're gonna talk about today. Um, and really we want to um, pick the one that's gonna be the fastest and the easiest for our client. So that sounds pretty straightforward and simple, and it is straightforward and simple. Sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error and trying different types of access options before we can actually figure out which one is the fastest and the easiest for our clients to use. Um, when we're picking access options, again, insurance buys the access option. So don't let price be something um, that makes it so you're not trying something with a client. You want the fastest, easiest access option. So the first thing we're gonna look at is the built-in accessibility settings on the app itself. Most communication apps or software will have some settings that you can tweak with that make them a lot easier to use. So let's take a look at one. I'm gonna show you today how I can make it easier to access communication apps by changing some of the items in the menu. So if you make accidental selections or find it difficult to touch the item that you want on the screen accurately, there's a few things built into the settings typically that can make that a little bit easier. The app that I have here today is Proloquo to go. Different apps are gonna have different things in the settings. So go ahead and play around with them. But I'm gonna show you two common ones. So I'm gonna open up the settings on Proloquo to go and I'm gonna look for access method. And you can see now it opens up a menu of a couple of different options that I can try. The first one is hold duration. Typically that is set to zero seconds, meaning if I touch an, a word on the screen, it's going to say it out loud instantly. But if I increase that hold duration a little bit, what that means now is I can touch things on the screen, but it won't make the selection until I hold it down for a little bit. So I'm gonna kind of tap around on the screen and you can see it's not making any selections until I hold my finger down long enough to make that selection. So if someone experiences hand tremors or just accidentally touches things you don't intend to, sometimes that whole duration can be helpful. And you can increase it and decrease it until it feels comfortable and easy to accurately select the words you want on the screen. I'm gonna show you one other thing in the settings. I'm gonna go back to access method, put our whole duration back down to zero, and I'm gonna show you the item called select on release. So I'll turn that on, and when I do, I get another menu option that pops up called configuration. So I'm gonna open that up so you can see what I can do here. But I can um, change the selection to either be the first finger that I pull up off the screen or the first finger that I put down on the screen. And that can be really helpful for users that have difficulty isolating a single finger to select items on the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna show you first finger up. And then I can put a visual cue so I knows which I know where I can select. And I'm going to actually make it really thick so it's going to be easy for us to see today. Um, and then I'm going to go back to my communication app. So I'm going to place my hand on the communication app, and you can see um, where it's registering my finger touch. And the red line is indicating if I pull one of those fingers up, that's going to select for me. So I'm going to pull my middle finger up and it opened up the want menu for me. And I'm gonna do the same thing again to be able to say want. So that's how I can 
um, basically be able to leave my hand on the screen and just pull up one finger to be able to make that selection, which might be easier for me to accurately select what I want. The next thing that we can do to make a communication device easier to use for our clients is we can change the grid size. So a lot of times um, our clients can do direct access on a touchscreen device. They can reach out and touch things, but maybe it's just difficult to touch really small targets. So we can adjust the grid size and make those targets bigger so that they're a little bit easier for our clients to reach out and touch. Okay, but there's a little bit of caution here. So I'm gonna show you um, what that looks like on a device and what we need to be cautious of so that we're not actually accidentally limiting communication options by increasing physical access. So let's take a look. Let's take a look and see what happens when we adjust the grid size and how that impacts our ability to physically interact with our communication app. The app I have here is Proloquo to go. I have it set up on a seven by seven grid size, meaning I have seven options across the top and seven down the side. So I'm gonna type the message that I wanna tell you. You can say it, you can say it. Okay, you saw there with minimal navigation, I was able to tell you a pretty complex sentence. But if I have difficulty touching the small buttons that are on my screen, I can change the grid size and that might make it easier for me to touch the buttons. So the way that I do that is I go into the settings, I'll show you how I got here. Um, you go to appearance, grid size, and you can see I have a ton of options. So I could make my grid size larger and have more communication options on the page, which would be smaller buttons, or I can make my grid size smaller to have those bigger buttons. So if I'm having difficulty touching the buttons accurately, I'm gonna try these bigger buttons. I'm gonna try a four by four grid size. Let me go back to my app and you can see that now I have really large buttons and they might be easier for me to touch, but I have far fewer communication options in front of me now, which is a downside. So I'm going to um, try to type that same message out so you can see how that impacts my ability to communicate with you. So I need to find you, so I have to go back home. You. To, like little words can. can. Go back. Say. Say, and go back home for it. it. You can say it. I was still able to tell you that pretty complex sentence. I had all the same vocabulary available to me, but you saw that it required a lot more navigation. Um, to be able to tell you the same sentence. So that has uh, two drawbacks. One, it makes communication take longer because I have to tap the screen a whole lot more. And the other part is that it makes it cognitively a little bit harder to find the words that I want to tell you. So when we're picking a grid size, we always want to pick the largest grid size that we can physically touch easily and accurately. If in order to be able to use direct selection and touch the screen, we have such a small grid size that it's really impacting our ability to communicate quickly and easily. We wanna look at an alternative access method so that the button size doesn't slow us down. Another alternative access that we can look at is just kind of some low tech add-ons that we can we can use so that is kind of a modification of direct select, I guess we could call it. So we could use a stylus. So if a client has difficulty isolating a finger to reach out and touch things, um, there are lots of different stylus. They come in all different shapes and sizes. You know, some of them are even mouth sticks. So if that's easy for our client to use direct select because they can use the stylus, then that um, would be a great low tech option. The picture I have here is the Faraday stylus and that end is bendable. So you can kind of configure it into all kinds of different handheld shapes to make it easy for your client to be able to pick up and independently use that stylus. Um, but there are lots of other brands and shapes and sizes there too. Um, the option that I'm showing on the right hand side of the screen is a key guard. And if you haven't seen a key guard before, they're really simple. It is just a plastic overlay that gets attached to the front of the device. And it kind of um, makes it so that, um, you know, if you're resting your hand on the device, it won't, you won't depress any keys. You actually have to put your finger in one of the holes to be able to touch 
um, the device. So those are just some low tech add ons that you can um, maybe put on a device if somebody is you know, just about there with direct select, but they need a little bit of extra um, modifications to be able to direct select on their device. So now I'm gonna move into talking about alternative access methods that don't use your hands at all. So the first one we're gonna look at is head control. So you can see on this gentleman here, he has a small silver dot. Um, it's a little sticker that's on his forehead, right in the middle of his forehead. And there is a head control camera on his device and it's sending an infrared light out to him that's reflecting back off of that little silver dot. And then um, the device is recording where his head moves. So if he moves his head to the right, the mouse cursor moves to the right, to the left, et cetera. In order to select a communication option on the screen, he either needs to hold his head in that position for just a moment. At a predetermined time, it will click for him. Otherwise, he can set up an external switch. Um, so there's a handful of options for head control. So this one here that this gentleman is using, it's a um, one that comes with the device that requires wearing that infrared sticker, that little reflective sticker. But there are a couple of other um, head tracking options for um, alternative mice. So these are all going to work on communication devices that are um, computer-based, not iPad-based at this particular moment. Um, so um, I have a couple of different brands here. The Glass House is a wearable. You wear it similar to glasses. That little blue piece is a uh, bite switch. So it goes in your mouth and when you wanna uh, click on something to, to select a word on your communication device, you would bite that switch, or you can replace that switch with any external switch you like. Um, the one in the middle, the Qha Zona, is a, um, a, a mouse that you can use as a head mouse, so you can actually attach that one to any body part that you can move easily and reliably, and the movement will make the mouse cursor move across the screen. And then to click, you can um, either dwell there for a small amount of time, or you can set up again an external switch to click. And the third option that I have shown here is Smile Mouse. And that one works a little bit differently. You don't have to wear anything with Smile Mouse. It's software that goes on the computer and it uses the computer's built-in webcam to track your facial features. So um, you can see by the outline um, on this picture here, it's tracking where this guy's eyebrows are. And so where he moves his head, the mouse cursor will move and he can set up to click in two different ways. One is if um, dwell click. So if he just holds his head to hold the mouse cursor there, it will click for him. Or he can set it to click with a smile, which you just have to smile slightly and it will click for you. So that could be a way to choose your communication options off of your screen. So I wanted to show you somebody using these different types of alternative access method. And I found um, this great YouTube video of Ellie using her head tracking device. Um, so it's going to be a, a YouTube video of her and her mother talking a little bit about her communication device. Um, this YouTube video is a few years old. So the head tracking, the hardware that she has on her device is a little bit older, um, but this is still a um, still an alternative access method that that we can consider. And you can see she is using one of the styles of head tracking where she has to wear the reflective dot on her forehead. So let's take a look at her story. Hi, my name is Ella Gorman. I am 14 years old. I like to go shopping at the mall. I have two brothers named Cole and Carter. Hi, my name is Jill O'Gorman and my daughter is Elle O'Gorman. She is 14 years old and diagnosed with cerebral palsy. This is my Dynavox. I use it to talk. Dynavox is an augmentative communication device that helps her communicate with us and her peers and at school. When I look at a picture using my head mask, the Dynavox talks for me. 
Without the Dynavox, she was, had a difficulty communicating what her needs were. People tend to um, underestimate her ability or what she understood and what she was able to express. I like to write emails with my Dynavox. Before I had my Dynavox, I used a laptop. We started out with just a simple book chart that was broken into categories and she would eye gaze towards the pictures that she wanted. From there, we advanced to uh, trying out a Pathfinder, which had too many buttons for her and was a little bit frustrating for her. Um, so we went to a laptop with a communication software. From there, we went to the Dynavox. I am learning to use more buttons to tell people what I am thinking. The school played a role in helping us find the Dynavox. The assistive technology specialist who has been helping of the district who helps Ellie um, was very instrumental in helping us. Ellie is on an IEP and so it was an IEP team decision to determine what device um, would work best for her. So they helped select the Dynavox, trial it, and then helped with funding. We contacted Dynavox first and did a, I believe, a six-week trial. During that trial period we had to write extensive amount of monitoring to give detail about the trial, the speech pathologist, along with the assistive technology specialist from the district helped in writing all of that up. And then we had to submit it to insurance to see if it would be approved. My teachers helped me with my Dynavox. I've, uh, we've all had training from Dynavox and um, again, the assistive technology specialist has trained her IEP team. So modifications and additions stuff are added by at school and sometimes I add them at home as I think of things um, so it's really a team approach. At school I can chat with friends, interact with my teachers, and practice my letters and numbers. The Dynavox has really opened up a lot of doors for Ellie in terms of just being able to tell us everything that she wants and needs and as well as helped with school and communicating with her peers and include some social opportunities for her. And so we will continue to, you know, explore future technology options, see if there's anything new and improved and, and better, which I'm sure there will be in the future. So much like Elle's mom mentioned at the end of that video, you know, I'm sure she said, I'm sure there'll be some better technology in the future. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about eye gaze as an alternative access. So if any of you used eye gaze about a decade ago or, or further, it was available, but it was really pretty um, glitchy. It didn't track well, you know, especially if you use glasses or or something like that. There were a lot of challenges to using it as an access method. Um, but in recent years and today, it is a very robust access method. It's available from a lot of different um, vendors and has opened up a lot of doors for communication and access. So I am gonna show you a quick video of um, the things that we want to consider when we're using eye gaze, um, including positioning, which is absolutely critical to getting eye gaze to work, and showing you how you can calibrate your eye gaze device um, so that then you can um, effectively use it as a access method to choose what you want on the screen. Hi, I'm Marlena with Montech, and I'm going to show you how to use an eye gaze bar to access your communication device. Um, I happen to have with me here today an accent, a parenchymic accent with their look, which is their eye gaze bar, but there's lots of other brands, Toby, Grid3, Control Bionics, um, but getting started setting up the eye gaze bar and getting it calibrated is pretty similar on all the different brands. So I'm going to show you how to get started. The first thing that you're going to want to do is make sure that your positioning is really good. The manufacturer will have recommendations for your positioning, but typically you're going to want to be about 20 inches or so from the device, and I'm going to want my eyes lined up with the middle to the upper two-thirds part of the screen. So you can see right now um, the two green dots on my screen. That means that this device can see both of my eyes. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit calibrate now. 
And I'm just going to follow these dots around the screen using my eyes. Okay, and it shows me the results of my calibration, which is successful. So now, um, before I move on, I'm going to show you a couple of other settings in the calibration. So by default, I had nine points that I needed to calibrate. If I can track all nine of those points, I'm going to have a better um, accuracy with my eye gaze bar. If I have difficulty following all of those five points to get started, I can go ahead and decrease the amount of um, calibration points that I need to follow. It might decrease your accuracy, but it might be enough to get you started using the device. Um, if both eyes don't see well or don't track together, I can choose which eye I want this eye gaze bar to follow. By default, it's typically set to both. And if I need different background colors or contrasts, I can change that. I can also adjust what stimulus I'm following around. So if tracking that little ball across the screen is not interesting or doesn't grab the visual attention um, of the user, you can change it. There's a couple of different options usually built in. Some of them have an animation or you can change the color. But since I'm finished with a good calibration, I am gonna go ahead and close out of here and go back to my communication menu. So I'm going to, um, first I'm going to clear my, I'm going to resume my eye gaze. Now I'm going to select clear to clear my communication bar up here. Now I'm going to type a sentence for you. I want. I want eats fruit apple. Apple. I want apple. Okay. I want Apple. So I'm going to pause my eye gaze by checking on the pause up here at the top so it stops. Okay. And what I was able to do was I use my eyes to look across the screen, pick which communication I wanted to say, and then I held my gaze there or dwelled on that object and the computer automatically selected that for me. And that's something I set up in my eye gaze access. So I can show you a couple of different options where we can change how we select which item on the screen we want. So I'm going to go back into our eye gaze access methods and I'm going to go into the eye tracking settings. Typically by default it's going to have that dwell option that we just looked at but there's usually two other options in addition to dwell. There's one that's blink so I can blink to select or I can use a switch, an external switch. So I happen to have here just a um, a button switch that's plugged into the switch interface on my device in the back and now I can look across the screen but it won't select anything until I hit the switch so let's give that a try I'm gonna look at finished select and I'm gonna close this select exit select okay so I'm gonna clear select I'm going to type that same sentence for you. I, I want, I want, eat fruit and apple. Apple. I want apple. Okay. And I'm going to pause my eye gaze. So that was just a way for me to um, change how I select items on the screen. You're going to want to play around with those settings and find which one is going to be the easiest and the fastest to be able to communicate as fast as you like. So now that you know a little bit about the basics of getting the eye gaze system set up and calibrated, I want you to listen to Ava's story about using eye gaze to control her device. We started to suspect that Ava had Rett syndrome because she wasn't meeting some of the milestones that, you know, as a parent you look for. And at 22 months, she was officially diagnosed. It must be really frustrating not to be able to use your hands, not to be able to talk, not to be able to just stand up and walk and go somewhere. I was on YouTube looking around and I found some videos of little girls with Rett syndrome using their Toby Dynavox. As a, someone who's learned some languages, I know that the earlier you start, the better. So I thought, well, if this is something that we're going to do, let's get started with it. My favorite thing about my sister is 
how she talks with her eyes. Hi. Hi. I can understand everything you are saying. Yeah. I am smart. And you're so smart, Ava. I am funny. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So Ava uses an iSeries i12 device, and she uses that primarily for talking. And at school, she has an iMini, our original PCI Go that we bought. She uses that for activities. It's a lot like starting off with a musical instrument like the piano. You can't just buy a piano and then all of a sudden they're playing beautifully. I have to show them. They have to be exposed to music. They have to watch other pianists play. It's not a learning process just for Ava. It's a learning process for the entire family. When we first started and I was just thinking, oh, please let her just be able to even select a button. How exciting would that be? And then, of course, she did that pretty quickly. And then she started saying single words here and there and then started combining words because I feel like that's the door to understanding Ava. And it's really exciting as a family. She's developing relationships with us, with her sister. Nothing makes me happier than watching Claire and Ava when they're playing, when we're reading and she's having fun. Clara and Ava will be snuggling with each other and saying, I love you, good night. Good night. Normally I'll walk into the door and she'll say a hi daddy out on the Toby Dynavox. That just gives me such a great feeling. It's just seeing the excitement in her eyes that is getting her point across that people can understand. She's like a typical child and she's able to communicate freely with us. We decided though from the start that we needed to be open with everybody and Ava has a Facebook account that her friends and family can see what she's saying. Can I try some? Ava has a program on her Toby that she can play music, play games, or draw. Here's a kid who is using her eyes to talk. It's helped her to control her emotions and to have some control over her life, learning to communicate, learning that she has a voice, learning that her voice has power. You know, some of the things that they said that she'd never be able to do, well, guess what, she's doing it. In one word, I would describe Ava in awesome. The final alternative access that we're going to look at today is called switch control. So switch control requires a few things. You need switches, you need a switch interface to connect to your device, and then if you put all those things together, you can control the device with your switches. I'm going to show you a few demonstrations um, so you can see what switch control looks like and the variety of options that you can um, change around in the settings to make switch access a little bit faster for your users. If you want to control your communication device using switches, there's a couple of things that you're going to need, and they're going to depend on which type of communication device you select. The first thing that you're going to need is, of course, a switch or possibly multiple switches. Switches come in a wide variety of different shapes, and sizes. I have a few laid out here on the table so you can see. Um, they can be mounted in any place that you have movement that is pain-free, fast, so that you can quickly hit that switch over and over again to be able to use it to control your communication device. Once you have your switch or switches selected and where you're going to place those, you need to figure out a way to connect your switches to your communication device. Um, if you are just using an iPad, not a dedicated device, but an iPad with a switch accessible app loaded on it, you're going to need a third piece of equipment that connects your switch input like this to your iPad, and that's called a switch interface. I have two that are popular here, the Bluetooth by Ablenet and the Tecla E. So these switch interfaces connect via Bluetooth to your iPad and you can plug your switches into these if you have external switches or there are switches built right into the top of these interfaces as well. So I'm going to show you how to connect those in your settings in just a minute. If however you happen to have a dedicated communication device, the switch interface is typically built right into the back of the device. So it's right in here. And then they will typically have switch ports right along the side that you would just plug your switches in here and then adjust the settings to use switches. So it's a little bit less complicated if you're using a dedicated device that's already set up to accept switches. But if you are using an iPad, I'm gonna show you how to use one of these interfaces to connect it to your iPad. Let's look at how we can connect a switch interface like this Ablenet Bluetooth 
or a switch interface like the Tecla E to our iPad. Um, first thing that we're going to need to do is open up the settings in our iPad, because these are gonna connect via Bluetooth. So I'm gonna open up my Bluetooth menu, and you can see I already have the Bluetooth on one of my devices, because I've previously paired it with this particular iPad, so it's already ready to go. So I only have to do it the one time. But I haven't yet paired this Tecla E, so let's get started. The steps are fairly similar, um, depending on what type of interface you're using. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make sure my Bluetooth is on on my iPad. And then I'm gonna find the on switch for my Tecla E. There it is. And I flip that to on and for the Tecla E, I need to also hold it, um, oops, hold it back so that it pops into a pairing mode, which it did actually automatically. So you saw it already pop up on my pairing, but the pairing mode is this kind of orange flashing light here. And that made the Tecla E pop into my other devices. So I'm gonna select that. And now it is paired with my iPad. So I am ready to go ahead and use this Tecla E to connect switches to control my iPad. So since this is connected, um, now I have a couple of different ways that I can use switches to control my iPad. One way I can use to control my entire iPad and everything on it is to go into my accessibility menu and under the category physical and motor, I'm gonna hit switch control. And if I set up all of my switches in here and turn that on, I can control my entire iPad using switches. Um, if however, you're just using a communication app and um, you're not wanting to control your entire um, iPad with switches, you can also go into the settings of your communication app, and we'll show that in another video. I'm going to show you how we can use switches like this one to control a communication device that is accessible with switches. So the app that I happen to have here is Toby Dynavox Snap, um, but there are several other switch accessible apps that are going to work fairly similarly. So the first thing that we need to do is connect this switch to my communication device, which I've already done. Then I need to go into the settings of my communication app and change it so that it is has an access method for switching. So default is always set to touch, and I'm going to change it to um, scanning so I can use some switches. And you see when I did that, it opened up this whole menu for switch scanning. Um, so I can change the behavior of what this one switch does, or I can even add a second switch. And we'll look at that in a minute. But I can speed it up and slow it down and customize it so it's really fast and accurate um, for someone to be able to use switches to control this communication device. So I'm going to start with one switch auto scan so you can see what that looks like. So once I've turned that on, my communication app automatically starts scanning through the choices. I haven't had to touch this switch at all yet. So in order for me to speak the word that I want, I need to wait until it gets to the item I want and then hit my switch. Switch, wait for it to get to the word I want. And then it's going to say my word out loud. So you can see I had a pretty good timing and wait for it to scan to the item that I want before I hit my switch. And again, you can adjust that to make it faster and easier to use. Um, but let's see what we can do if we add a second switch. So I'm gonna go back into my settings and I'm gonna go to my access method again. And instead of one switch auto scan, I'm going to use two switch step scan. And so what two switch step scan does is now I can use two switches and I have a lot more control over what happens on my communication device if I can use two switches. So I can use one switch to step through my options. So you can see that is stepping through all my communication options. And the second switch will be my selection. So now I'm gonna move down my rows. and select. So if I can use two switches, I have a lot more control over what's happening on my switch screen. You can see this required being able to hit the switches repeatedly um, and quickly for me to be able to move through all of my options. So that's an example of how you can use switches to control a communication app. 
So now I want to show you another YouTube video that I found of this young man whose name is Brad, and he is going to show you how fast somebody can use switches to communicate. Okay. Um, so I have a question for you. Uh, you know, uh, you know that you got a pretty fast scanning speed there. Yeah, you're aware of that. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, how much do you how much do you have to look at the screen and how much do you know how fast you have to move your leg to say stuff can you make a can you tell me about that Hello. Hey guys. How are you doing? I'm well, Marin. How are you, Verda? Brad's mid thought here. <laughs> I gotcha. Because you weren't looking? Uh, I see. All right. So now that we've looked at a lot of different alternative access options from just making some adjustments on the built in settings all the way to more complex technology like eye gaze access, you're probably thinking, well, that's great, but how do I get to try these options with my client? And you have a couple of options that are available to you. Um, some of you may work in big clinics and you actually have some of this technology available in your clinic, like a little bit of a loan closet or um, technology that's available to you when you're doing evaluation with your client. And if that is so, that's great, that's fantastic. Um, I know here in Montana, it's a very rural community. So a lot of you aren't going to have access to this technology at your place of work. Um, but there's a couple of options for you so you can still try out these um, different devices, communication devices, and the access methods with your client. The first is going to be the communication device vendors. So um, big brand names like Toby Dynavox, Prenki Romic, or PRC um, Saltillo is the name of them now. Um, Grid 3, Control Bionics, Lingraphica, 
all of these different big vendors for communication devices, they all have a loan program. If you are in the process of doing an evaluation with your client to determine what type of communication device they need and the access accessories that they need, they have a loan program. So you'll be able to try out um, those devices from the vendors directly. Each of them have a little bit different requirements, but check with your vendor. The second option that's available to you is the state assistive technology program, like Montech that I work for. Um, so every state has a state assistive technology program. Um, we all have some federal directives that we do. So we all are gonna have the services that I have shown here um, on this slide, but some of us also do different types of services depending on our um, additional other funding. Um, so the state assistive technology programs are gonna provide two things that are gonna be really useful to you. One is um, we are to provide information and assistance. So if you call up your state AT program or send them an email, you can get a lot of information about what types of different brand names are out there, what types of technology features might really match up well with your clients needs and challenges. So um, state AT programs can help with that. They also typically have demonstration centers, which means you can come in for a free appointment. Um, in Montana, we do free appointments in our main office in Missoula and also in our satellite office in Billings, as well as we do them virtually via Zoom. So we can show you a lot of different types of technology. That's a great brainstorming session. Um, so you can see what might work best for your clients. If you can come in person, it's really fantastic to be able to get your hands on the device. It's um, a whole different ball game to be able to try the device, adjust the settings, see what's gonna work best for you and your client than it is to watch a training video like this. So it's really beneficial if you can get some hands-on practice. Um, the second, service that we provide. And in Montana, we provide it for free. Some state AT programs will have minimal charges, such as for uh, maybe shipping one way or both ways, um, but it should be very low cost and accessible, is that we loan out all different types of equipment, not just communication devices and the access methods, but you know, um, any type of different assistive technology we loan out. We have thousands of different devices in Montana alone that we loan out to Montanans. Um, so the way that that works is you just check out the items that you want, they get shipped to you, you can try them for 30 days and then you send them back to us when you're done. Um, so those services in Montana, they're available to any Montanan with any disability, any age, okay? And if you're not in Montana, no worries. Um, there is an organization just like Montech in your state. So you have these slides available to you as part of the conference handout materials. And there's a link at the bottom of this slide where you can look up your state assistive technology program. So if you haven't worked with your state AT program, I really recommend you call them up and see what kind of services that they provide to you for free or for a low cost to see how you can use them to help your clients. So let's move into the third and final part of today's training is that the communication device can do a whole heck of a lot more than just talk out loud, okay? So a lot of times um, I will talk with OTs that are a little bit resistant to getting involved in, in working with that communication device because they think, well, that's, you know, that's really the job of the speech language pathologist. Um, and hopefully the second session that, or the second section of our training today on access methods convinced you how valuable OTs are to that therapy team that selects the device and customizes the device so that we can make sure our clients have the best access. But another really important reason why OTs wanna be involved with that communication device is some of the higher tech devices, they are also, they're really just a computer or an iPad that happens to have some communication software on it that talks out loud. But if we can get really good access to that device, we open up a whole nother avenue for our clients to pursue other meaningful occupations. And this is especially true for our clients that have very significant motor impairments um, because if they can access their communication device, they can access a whole bunch of other things too. 
So the first video that I want to show you um, is a video, a YouTube video that Steve Gleason made. And if you're not familiar with Steve Gleason, he is a former NFL Saints football player. Um, he also has ALS and has been instrumental in um, getting legislation passed, the Enduring Voices Act, um, that pertains to communication devices and all of the um, access accessories that are needed with that device. So he's been instrumental in that, as well as working with tech companies and really um, pushing the bar towards advancing those technologies so that they um, can do more and are more robust. But he made this really brief YouTube video that we're gonna watch. Um, and I, when you're watching this video, he's not gonna be doing any communication, but all of the things that are happening in the video, he is doing that by using his eyes on his communication device. So when you watch this video, just tick through all the different things that he's doing. Okay, so you saw all the different things that Steve Gleason could do just using his eyes on his communication device. He did everything from open the blinds, turn on the lights, control the thermostat, even unlock and open his front door, all just using his communication device. Um, I'm gonna show you another video. Um, this video is from Pranky Romic Saltillo, and this is Vanessa, and she is a young woman who's going to tell you all of the things that she likes to do with her communication device, and some of them are communication, but she's going to tell you about a whole lot of other occupations um, that she likes to do using her device. My name is Vanessa Salas. I am 21 years old. I live in Buckeye, Arizona with my mom and dad and sister and brother. I use internet. I use internet. What is the weather in Amarillo, Texas? Play 90s country radio. Read my calendar for today. We're going to mall. We're going to mall with Miss Patty. Play louder. I get on Facebook. I ask people questions. My life goal is to write my life book. Okay, so you saw there that Vanessa listed all kinds of different things that she did on that device and that weren't necessarily um, communicating out loud with the person next to her. So um, the speech generating devices can include all kinds of accessories and it's really great if OTs can be involved during the evaluation so we can make sure that this is baked right into the communication device that's available in the software on the communication device. But they can have phone access, text access, computer use. So remember, again, the communication device is typically either an iPad or a Windows-based computer. And so it can do a whole lot of other things um, that are not just communicating out loud. So you can work all the things that you do at work, you can do on this communication device. You can open up Microsoft Word and write up um, a paper. You can open up your email. You can get on the internet and do research or just browse for leisure. Um, and then environmental controls. We saw a ton of those in the um, Steve Gleason YouTube video. Um, a lot of the devices, some of them will have infrared controls built in. And if you're not familiar with those, they work pretty similar to like your TV remote is an infrared controller and they only control a few types of devices. So like your stereos, your TV, thing like things like that. And that's typically built into um, 
a few of the different types of communication devices, but a lot of them now, which is really exciting, will have um, software that makes them compatible to control smart home devices. So you saw all of the different things that Steve Gleason was able to do just using his communication device. Um, there's really anything in the home that you can think of, you would be able to control through that device. Um, so again, I just want to drive home the point. There are so many meaningful occupations that are in our scope of practice that you can use that device to do. Everything from increasing participation in ADLs to doing your IADLs right on the device, um, or things like work, education, leisure activities, all of those things that are in our scope of practice, that device can be really a critical gateway to being able to do those things for our clients. So um, hopefully this will be um, a good list of ideas to convince you that it would be um, worth your time to work on the access method for that device um, with your clients. So if you have any questions on this YouTube video, if you're watching it as part of the conference, we are having a virtual live question and answer session. We tried to schedule it during a lunch break, so hopefully that will be accessible to a lot of you. It's um, scheduled for Tuesday, November 2nd from 12 to 1, and that's Mountain Time. So if you're available then, if you have questions, even if you want to get on there and share um, stories um, of things that you've done with clients, um, that would sure probably be helpful to other people in the Q&A session as well. Um, so I hope to see you there if you have questions um, for this conference. And then this is my contact information. If you're in Montana, um, again, my name is Marlena Lenini. I'm in our Billings Outreach Office. And then this is my co-workers um, contact information in our main office in Missoula, if you're closer to there. Um, so Michelle Allen would be the AT um, specialist. She is um, my counterpart over in Missoula and Dave Gentry um, is our resource coordinator and he can help with loans or your account or anything like that. Um, and there's our contact information and website. If you are in another state other than Montana, please get in touch with your state AT program. I hope you find that they have many valuable resources to help you in working with your clients. So thanks for watching this training today um, and don't hesitate to come to the live Q&A session if you have some questions. Thank you.